Hello. Hi, good evening. Uh, also very honored to be here. Thank you, Fierce, for having me. Uh, my name is Yedek Froland. I'm a candidate running for City Council here in the 3rd City Council District. Uh, I'm running because I think that we need a strong, independent, outspoken advocate who can be a voice for us in city government. Uh, I've been a civil rights attorney, I've been an educator, a small business owner, I created a language center, uh, and I've been an advocate for this community for over two decades. Um, but I also think that this community has a very strong tradition in the LGBT community, and I'm especially impressed by the work of FIERCE because it brings uh, LGBT youth, uh, communities of color, and other marginalized communities together in a really powerful and empowering way. So I guess the three points that I want to talk about in terms of my candidacy and what I'd like to see happen uh, as a city council member. Um, First of all, as a civil rights attorney, I founded an LGBT-focused law firm that sought and seeks to represent those who are often marginalized and don't have a voice uh, in the legal process. And um, in doing that, I've had occasion to represent folks in a myriad of different ways, but one way in particular is to fight against uh, some of the hate crimes that we've seen. And you all know we've recently seen all too much of that, even here in the Third City Council District. And one of my uh, clients was Josie Smith Molave. You guys know who she is? Chef Josie from uh, from TV hit the, the, the hit show Bravo TV. She's a celebrity. You would think that she would be uh, accorded a certain respect. Uh, several years ago, she was brutally attacked by a group of over 12 uh, individuals who beat her, uh, called, made all sorts of anti-gay epitaphs while her sister was there, and uh, laughed and took photos of it while it was happening. And. Uh, the police at first didn't want to do anything about it. They refused. They said that a crime hadn't occurred. Um, and we were able to organize and to reach out to the DA uh, in Long Island and ultimately get the perpetrators uh, charged with hate crimes. I think that was an important step uh, towards remedying some of this. Second of all, I think it's important to recognize today, actually, the city council overturned Bloomberg's veto uh, on the stop and frisk law. So that was really Uh, continuing to build bridges and connect the dots. I see myself as working in coalition. I think that's why I've gotten the endorsement of people like former Mayor Dinkins, uh, Freddie Ferrer, uh, Council Member Jonas Rodriguez. And third of all, and finally, I just want to say uh, I passed out an article from the New Civil Rights Movement that recently talked about a three point plan that I have to try to remedy some of the problems with the spate of hate crimes. Because we all know it's not space, this is an ongoing, consistent problem. And you know, the police may come beef up security for a little while, we have pre press conferences, but then the, the problems continue. I know I'm out of time, but uh, I look forward to working on that as well. So thank you very much. Um, at this point, me and Hector will moderate a question and answer session. Um, you, you each have about two minutes to answer each question, and our timekeeper, Fred, will keep track of how much time you have to answer each of those questions. Um, so actually, we'd like to give you each three minutes to answer each question. Um, the first question is for Yetta, followed by Corey. The first question is, as you may be aware, stop and frisk has been a practice conducted by the NYPD that has resulted in illegal searches of peoples based on race, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, and other identities. What is your opinion on stop and frisk, and where do you stand on the court's decision stating that NYPD's tactic of stop and frisk violates people's constitutional rights? Sure. Um, as I said earlier, I was delighted by the decision in City Council today. Many of my friends were the folks involved in the lawsuit uh, that was victorious. I was very proud of the federal judge for taking a principled and civil rights position on this issue. Uh, I have long uh, stood out and spoke up against uh, the, the policies of stop and frisk. I helped to organize and take part in the silent march that happened in Harlem a little over a year ago. Um, and I also am one of the lead attorneys who initiated a federal lawsuit, a different federal lawsuit, uh, more from the consequences of the wrongful arrests and activity that was happening during Occupy Wall Street, but also addressing the issues of stop and frisk. And basically, I think, um, we need uh, legislative reform, we need judicial reform, and we need to be able to set our NYPD up for success. The police department, the police officers, 
should not be people that we fear. They should be people here to protect and serve us, all of us. And I will be deeply committed uh, to continuing that work in City Council. I'm very proud of my colleagues and friends in City Council today who overturned uh, uh, Bloomberg's veto. And I look forward to a, a new era, uh, a post-stop and frisk era that includes everybody in our city and respects and gives dignity to everybody. Thank you. I totally agree that stop and frisk has been a policy that has disproportionately, uh, in gigantic numbers, targeted people of color, especially young people of color, in a way that has not helped the city. Numbers don't lie. And what do the numbers show? The numbers show that 99 point, I think it's 2% of all stops result in no gun being found, which is a supposed reason to stop people and frisk them to find a gun. So what happens? It divides local communities, and it doesn't just divide local communities that are predominantly residential communities of color. It divides communities like the heart of the West Village. If you look at the statistics from the 6th Precinct on stop and frisks in this neighborhood, the population here, the residential population, is overwhelmingly Caucasian and white, but the stops are overwhelmingly done to young people of color. I'm sure many people who are part of FIERCE, who are here tonight, have been stopped for no apparent reason. What does this do? This divides communities. A mother is afraid to send their, her 17 or 13 year old son to the store to get a gallon of milk because she's afraid that her son is gonna be thrown against a wall and frisked by a police officer for no apparent reason. Good policing is policing where the police and the community trust each other and want to work together. I totally support the Community Safety Act uh, that was passed by the City Council and the Mayor's veto was overridden today. I support uh, the bill before the Council that passed on creating an Inspector General in the City Council to have further oversight uh, at the Council level. And I believe that the way that successful community building and, and policing works is when people trust each other. I'm very happy that the judge's decision came down last week, Judge Scheinlin, uh, from the uh, district court, and uh, I hope that uh, while the appeal is in place, because the city said they are appealing that decision, while the appeal is in place, that monitor is put in place at the NYPD to make sure that these policies are not being done in a way that are unfairly targeting people in New York City based solely on the color of their skin and not based on them committing any crime. The objective that people are using now, officers are using, are furtive movements, or that the person looks suspicious. That is not constitutional. You have to have probable cause to stop someone and frisk them and to check them. And one last thing, when these stop and frisks are happening, especially among young people, when they find condoms on them, they are trying to prosecute young people for prostitution. It is absolutely wrong in every way, and the NYPD should stop it immediately. This question will be for Corey, followed by Yetta. In the West Village, we have seen a difference of opinion concerning the issue of safety. Some people call for increased policing to address violence, but for many LGBTQ people of color, that is not the answer. What would you do to bring safety in the West Village that accommodates different stakeholders in the West Village? It's a great question, it's an important question. I do not believe that the answer is increasing police on the streets. We have seen that it hasn't worked. What needs to happen is, the way police interact with both uh, young LGBT youth of color and the broader community needs to be in a respectful way, in a way that understands different people, where they're coming from and why they're here. Let's look at the history of the West Village. It is a place that's been for artists, bohemians, uh, gay people, uh, gender non-conforming people that came here and were part of this community and made this community a beautiful community. We have to not demonize people based on the color of their skin, who they are, how they express themselves. And I think one thing that needs to really happen is, uh, and I want to do this when I'm on the council, is to work with the local police precinct, the 6th precinct, as well as one police plaza, not on putting more cops on the street, 
but on working with the local police precinct on saying, this is how you interact with young people. This is how you interact when there is an issue. I am not saying that we want to tolerate people that are uh, committing crimes. But what is happening is the vast, vast, vast majority of people that are on the street, whether they be young LGBT uh, youth, are not committing crimes. They are being demonized and victimized because of who they are and they've decided to come here. I am very proud of the work that Fierce has done, whether it's been fighting against the closure of the park at 10 o'clock at night and winning that battle, whether it's been having uh, lots of community initiatives on the Christopher Street Pier, uh, educating young people. That's the type of work that we need to do in this community. Bringing people together, educating people, working with the police in a real uh, productive way. And I want to do that when I'm on the council. Increasing police, that's an easy thing to say. The real nitty gritty hard work is actually sitting down with all the stakeholders and saying, how do we make this better? How do we bring people together? How do we stop all of this conflict in the neighborhood? That's what we need to do. And so the 6th Precinct actually has a new commanding officer. Her name is Deputy Inspector Lisa Kokinos. She was the commanding officer in Chelsea for the past four years, and she actually did a very good job in Chelsea of working with the local community uh, and, uh, and LGBT people in that community. I would love to work with uh, Deputy Inspector of the 6th Precinct, Fierce, the Community Board, the Hudson River Park Trust, and other local leaders to make sure that we have a real, honest, thoughtful conversation about this, because it hasn't been working. We have to stop, reset, and come together to figure out how to make it work. So, I actually disagree, uh, uh, respectfully. I think community policing was very effective. The Dinkins administration actually gets an unfair um, ding, claiming that they actually didn't decrease crime. The reality is, if you look at statistics, the Dinkins administration actually reduced crime, and the way that they did it was with a community policing plan uh, that did put cops on the street but train them to be receptive and responsive from the community and of the community and with the community. This is the problem. All communities, including marginalized communities, of course should live free of fear of being harassed or intimidated by the police, but they should also be able to utilize the police if and when they need them. Meaning, we need to create an NYPD, we need to totally reform the NYPD and set them up for success so that they are responsive to the needs of everybody, irrespective of race, gender, and sexual orientation. I actually happen to be the legal counsel for the Gay Officers Action League. The reality is there are police officers who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, uh, from communities of color, women. Uh, we need to make sure that we're building bridges and coalitions between all of our agencies, including the NYPD, so that they are fully serving all communities. Everyone pays the same taxes, everybody is afforded the same opportunities and resources from our government, whether that be from the fire department, whether that be from the police department, whether that be from our public schools, and everybody should be able to benefit from that. When I talk about dealing with the problem with the spate of hate crimes, what I've proposed is that we do actually have, because every time there's a hate crime that's happened, recently on 23rd Street, earlier uh, the unfortunate death of Mark Carson, the immediate response of the 6th Precinct and the NYPD is to beef up security for a few days. And to be, I have to say that, that the 6th Precinct has been very receptive and responsive uh, to the needs of the community and wanting to help and, and, and address this issue. The problem is we can't just show up for a few days and then disappear. We have to look long term. And the other thing that we need to do, what I would do as a city council member, is make sure that we're capturing incidences giving more teeth to the CCRB if there are problems within the NYPD, as well as capturing incidences of hate crime so that we can prophylactically look at the where, when, and how this type of violence happens so that we can get our NYPD to stop it from happening towards the LGBT community, towards communities of color, towards the LGBT communities of color, and uh, for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I rule. <laughs> Much better. Okay. Do you want me to say that again? I'm just kidding. <laughs> the following question is for Yana, followed by Corey. The percentage of homeless youth in New York City is increasing. 
and over 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. Along with the lack of beds and services for homeless youth in New York City, there are lack of community and senior centers. If elected, what work will you do to restore social services and shelters for LGBTQ youth, homeless folk, and senior citizens? It's a great question, and I'm here tonight to pledge my absolute support uh, to not only fund those events, and as a citizen, obviously, not an elected official, I've taken part in many uh, fundraisers and events uh, to bring attention to the issue, uh, to help raise funds for uh, homeless youth, um, and I'll continue to do that as a city council member, and paying specific attention to the way that the LGBT community, uh, youth community, is especially vulnerable for uh, homelessness. And I don't need to tell you guys the statistics, as you said, 40%. Um, almost half a million LGBT youth homeless in this country. Um, oh, most, you know, most uh, at, at average age of 14 years old for homeless youth in New York City, for trans youth, it's even a younger age, about 13 and a half. Um, most LGBT homeless youth, most, have experienced sexual assaults uh, in their experiences being homeless. This is a serious issue. Uh, again, I don't need to tell you that, uh, but I will be a partner with you in helping to address these issues. I think we need to get funding. We also need to get visibility and awareness, and we need to make sure that there's tolerance in, you know, we have very few LGBT-specific homeless beds. The Alley Forney Center is one of the locations where there are uh, uh, beds specifically for the LGBT youth uh, homeless population. But we need to do two things. We need to create more beds for the LGBT uh, homeless population, and we also need to teach tolerance for other homeless shelters that are not LGBT-specific. We also need to think about the way, again, um, communities of color, women, and subjugated gender are even more vulnerable in those communities, and I would work uh, to do that. And I've also worked with organizations um, like Hollaback, NYC. Hollaback is an organization that deals with street harassment and street violence. Um, has a website that helps people who are being antagonized in the street uh, to capture those incidences and kind of make it public. I think it's an eloquent way uh, to deal with some of that violence, um, not just uh, for the LGBT community, for the trans community, for women, and for anybody who is unfairly uh, and discriminatorily targeted in those ways. Thank you. It is such an important question. You know, my mother, who lives about 35 miles north of Boston, uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, helps run the homeless uh, shelter in Salem. And I, two and a half years ago, or two years ago, I don't remember the exact amount of time, uh, joined the board. I'm on the board of the California Center. So I have been doing this work in a really meaningful way with Carl Siciliano and all the folks at AFC and making sure that the stories of young LGBT people who are homeless are actually told. Because that is the most moving thing for people. When they hear about a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, or 15-year-old who has been thrown out of their home, who is sleeping on, on the subway at night, who is unable to get a shelter bed, or when they do, as Yetta mentioned very accurately, they're in typically a shelter system that is not understanding, that is not accommodating, that doesn't understand their specific needs, and in many times it's dangerous for them to actually be in that shelter system. So well, what do we need to do? Right now, the beds that we have in New York City uh, are funded by uh, DYCD, the Department of Youth and Community Development. And that is a city agency that the city council funds on an annual basis. New York City has a $78 billion budget. That budget is a budget of our priorities. What do we prioritize in New York City? Two years ago, there was a, it was either two or three years ago, there was a fight both in Albany and down at City Hall on cutting beds. Cutting the number of existing beds. Like we have too many beds for homeless LGBT youth. It is insane. This is not the way our budget processes work in New York City, and this is not the way uh, we need to come up with a solution for this. The LA Forney Center is going to be opening an amazing building called the B. Arthur Residence. B. Arthur from Golden Girls left over a million dollars to the Alley Forney Center to build a residence in her name for LGBT youth who are homeless. 
If I'm on the city council, I'm going to make sure that the Department of Homeless Services, that the Department of Youth and Community Development, and that every year when we go through our budget cycle, that young, homeless, LGBT people are actually talked about. That their lives are talked about. That their value is talked about. And that it is criminal that this city and Albany continue to allow young, vulnerable, vulnerable people to live on the streets of New York City without protection, care, shelter, nutrition. It is immoral. And I will not let it stand when I'm on the council. We are very lucky. Lou Fiddler, who is terminal out of office, who's from Brooklyn, has been a champion on the issue of LGBT youth in the city council. And I will be honored to follow in his footsteps, continue to advocate for homeless LGBT youth. Next question will be for Corey, followed by Yetta. As most of us know, St. Vincent's Hospital was one of the only emergency medical spaces for residents and visitors of the village. However, due to gentrification in the neighborhood, we have seen it taken out of the community. What will you do to bring a hospital back to the West Village community? It's one of the most important issues that we talk about on the Lower West Side of Manhattan. I live at 15th Street and 7th Avenue, three blocks from the St. Vincent site. When I walk by on a daily basis, my stomach churns and actually seeing what is happening on that site. As many of you know, St. Vincent's was a 161-year-old institution that was here for the community from the survivors of the Titanic, through the AIDS epidemic, through 9-11. And I think one thing that people haven't talked about, some people have, but it's important to say that countless lives have probably already been lost with the closure of St. Vincent's because we don't have a hospital on the Lower West Side of Manhattan. It's dangerous, it's not in uh, the public health uh, of our city in a good way. And what we need to show is that since 2007, 11 hospitals have closed in New York City. 11. Hospitals are being looked at as profit-generating centers, and not as places that actually serve the public. We need to totally change the conversation and say, there is real value in city, state, and federal governments and in investing money into hospitals and making sure we don't lose them. It looks like uh, Litch may close in the next couple of weeks out in Cobble Hill, another hospital that we're losing. It's dangerous. We have to keep fighting for a hospital. We know that one is not going to return at the St. Vincent site because of the rooting plan for luxury condos there, which I testified against at the city council. And we know that there is scarce land in the heart of those villages to find a site. I think the community needs to come together. Whoever the council member is, we have to come together with the State Department of Health, with the administration, whoever the next mayor is with uh, our federal representatives and say there is a dire need for a hospital in the heart of the West Village. How do we all come together, work together in a meaningful way to make the case uh, to build a true public hospital here with public funds or to attract a private uh, institution that may want to come and build a hospital here because they see value in doing it. We have to keep fighting for that, and the only way we can do it is by coming together and having a real serious conversation about how it's going to get done. And I want to be part of that conversation, and I think that people in the West Village and in Chelsea and in Soho deserve a hospital for the Lower West Side of Manhattan. 